Hello. Our story begins inside the Republic military complex. Ahsoka was visited by Anakin and Padme who were here to speak with her about her appeal. Padme is going to run a defense for Ahsoka, and Anakin was here to be her support. Before he arrived, he sent out a good friend on an important mission. Anakin wanted to be in two places at once, but he believed that someone of Barriss' caliber would be the perfect ally to track down and defeat Asajj Ventress. Anakin told Ahsoka the entire plan, and even the added detail that Barriss was unaware of. Anakin was making sure that he used his rank as general to the best of his abilities. Ahsoka was grateful, and she was even more so that Anakin would be here with her throughout this process. Anakin did want to track down Asajj and make her pay, though his reasoning for not going himself was his fear. Not that he couldn't beat her, but that he would outright lose control and kill her. He had done that before and he wasn't willing to sacrifice the life of the most important person in this case against Ahsoka's trial. Barriss was a calmer Jedi, one who had a heart of gold, and someone who would have no issue defending Ahsoka and helping her find success in her trial. Barriss accepted the mission with incredible haste, so much so that Anakin almost retracted his offer. It was a little odd how she pounced on the idea, but he understood that her emotions might be out of balance with everything going on. Anakin gave her very basic instructions, and considering she was just a year younger than him, he believed that this would be very easy for her. She was told to track down Asajj and capture her, before bringing her to the court so they could acquit Ahsoka. Anakin told her what the troopers last reported on Asajj's location, or where she and Ahsoka had been seen. All she had to do was sneak up on her, beat her, and bring her back. To Barriss, this was the perfect deal. She could quote-unquote accidentally kill Asajj Ventress and then layer some nanobite technology into her robes, so it would appear that she was responsible. The only issue is, Barriss didn't have time to get rid of the nanotechnology that was on her robes. She couldn't change at the moment because Anakin was adamant that she leave now. So she had to hope that she didn't mess up. Her only motive was to kill Ventress, call it an accident, and hopefully save Ahsoka's life. She didn't want her friend to be hurt by this encounter. She just wanted to make a message and send it to the Jedi Council, one that she was unsure if they received or not. Regardless, the second part to this plan was initiated by Anakin once he left the temple. He instructed Arc Trooper Fives and Captain Rex to take two separate groups of clones. They would go down into the Undercity. Anakin didn't want them to interact with Barriss unless they were helping her bring back Asajj to the courts, or they found Asajj before the Jedi Padawan. Anakin didn't have any suspicions for Barriss. The only thing he wanted to make sure of was that there were more troops in the area working together, but without knowing that the clones were near her. Anakin wanted them to naturally track this former Sith assassin, believing it'd be more beneficial. This was entirely based on the failure the Republic troopers had in tracking down Ahsoka when she was with Asajj, so he was simply trying this as a potential counter to that mess up. Barriss would be notified once the mission was completed, if completed by the clones. Rex took a group of 20 of his best men, and as did Fives. Anakin would sit in as Padme and Ahsoka did most of the talking. Truthfully, he didn't like putting Ahsoka's fate into Barriss' hands. Not that he didn't trust her, no, they were classmates and actually friends, but he preferred doing things himself. It's something that was so integral to who he was. But aside from the fact that he thought he might kill Asajj if he saw her, he wanted to be here for Ahsoka. He could tell she was scared. It was on both her face and in her spirit. One didn't need to have the force to feel the weight emanating off of her. The discussions weren't overly hopeful, but no one in the room knew how harsh the Republic planned on treating the assault. The fact of the matter is, Palpatine was informing his good ally, Tarkin, that he would levy the strictest sentence on Ahsoka. Palpatine wanted Tarkin to be the one to issue out the punishment so it wouldn't be connected back to Palpatine. He just wanted Anakin to see this as the fault of the Jedi and be enraged for their failure to react properly. For Palpatine, this was just the perfect scenario. After a couple hours, the stage was set. Barriss and two squads of clones separately moved into the underbelly of Coruscant, while a couple Jedi Masters from the High Council sat across from the jury. Anakin accompanied Ahsoka as Padme took over position as a defense. Inside the courtroom, Anakin walked to the podium with Ahsoka and stopped. Four shock troopers flanked him and he stood with a disgruntled look. Palpatine stepped up to the judge's seat and addressed the proceedings. Tarkin came out and the fun of the defense and prosecution began. In the lower levels of the city, Barriss moved discreetly, using Asajj Ventress's lightsabers as she snuck around. She was trailing Ventress, and she knew how to find her. Considering she was able to sneak up on the former Sith assassin once, she had no issue believing that she could do it again here. 
Ferris was very focused on one objective. She just needed to kill Asajj. She had all the information to expose the truth about who Ahsoka was connected to and contacted before she was attacked in the warehouse. If she could clear her name, perhaps she could even save her friend from her own actions. As she was doing this, the two squads of clones moved about her level. They had a tracker for her vessel, but they followed the same clues that Anakin gave to her. They didn't have sights on her, but she didn't even notice that the clones were down here. Ferris, after about 30 minutes, found a hooded figure that looked like Asajj moving around. She smiled to herself and moved in, creeping along a pipeline and using it to jump across to another building. Asajj looked up, feeling something familiar but knowing it wasn't Ahsoka. She looked for something to defend herself with, and as she found something, she saw her crimson lightsabers coming down at her from the sky. Asajj rolled out of the way and swung a piece of metal at the attacker, only for it to be cut into pieces before her very eyes. Inside the courtroom, a defense for the life of Ahsoka Tano was being waged. Anakin was becoming more and more tense. His shoulders were stiffened, his hands were bald, and his face was creased. Anakin's gaze was focused on Palpatine. He wanted to make a move, but he wouldn't. He couldn't. There was too much of a risk in making Ahsoka even more at fault for the actions of another. Everything felt so surreal. For Anakin, the time split. He was present, but his mind was elsewhere. As Padme explained out the events he lived through, he remembered how odd it was for the Jedi and Tarkin and Palpatine to just accept her as the individual responsible for the bombing. They weren't even on Coruscant, they were on Keda Nimodia when it happened. It didn't make any sense. He slowly moved out of his mind and his thoughts drifted to Barriss, hoping she'd find any sort of luck. In the Undercity, Barriss was swinging her lightsabers viciously, but all of Asajj's training and experience in life gave her the ability to avoid these attacks. Just like Dooku explained to her, she was focused on disarming her opponent. Numerous of times, she sparred with Dooku and started without a weapon. If she could disarm someone as talented as Dooku, there should be no issue for her. She ducked under and kicked forward, using a dumpster and throwing it across the ground as it clipped Barris in the ankle. She let out a scream in pain as Asajj took advantage by kicking forward and hitting Barris in the face. She dropped one of the lightsabers as Asajj was able to grab it. She backed up as Barris struck at her. Luckily for Asajj, she was flexible. If she wasn't, she'd be dead. Barris was very light on her recently crushed ankle, but she was able to move into the fight. Ventress parried and struck. She had another advantage. These were her blades. The foolish Jedi Padawan thought she could just use Asajj's weapons to win. She threw her blade forward with incredible speed, forcing Barris to lean backwards, which Ventress used, but by kicking down on her bad ankle. She saw Barris wince in pain and threw her blade forward. Barris was caught in the stomach. She let out a little groan before Asajj grabbed the other lightsaber out of Barris' weak hand before dragging it down across her neck killing her instantly. Asajj was going to say something petty, but before she could, she was shot with five stun rounds and knocked out by Rex's men. Captain Rex told Vong to contact General Skywalker and give him an update. If he could elongate the trial, he might be able to save Ahsoka's life. The clones need to act fast though. Vaughn quickly moved to contact the General. Anakin was still standing impatiently, stiff as a boulder. His concentration was broken when his wrist started vibrating. He looked down and caught Ahsoka's gaze in the corner of his eye. Anakin nodded reassuringly in hopes that this would get the message across. It didn't. He excused himself quietly from the hearings as he listened to Vong. The clone trooper explained everything. They were coming to assist Barris, but they got there too late, only hearing the commotion as they closed in on her by accident. Anakin hit his hand against the wall and asked that they could bring Asajj in, and while they were on their way here, if they were able to do a scan on her outfit. Hopefully they could find residue of the nanobite tech on it. If not, then Ahsoka might be out of luck. Anakin thanked them for doing their work and ended the call. Vong returned to Rex to finish up what they were supposed to do. Though there was a surprising revelation, they'd come upon before ever getting to the courts. Anakin moved back to the chambers, where everything was transpiring. And before he walked out the door, he stopped. He could hear Palpatine speaking through the wall. He could hear his close mentor suggest that throughout the war, the Separatists have manipulated their way into their very government into their war effort. He pleaded with the jurors to consider that before coming to the decision. The fact that Ahsoka Tana could very well be a Separatist operative. Anakin grabbed his lightsaber off his belt and prepared to storm his good friend. He was so outraged, but then he considered. If he did that, there'd be no saving Ahsoka. There'd be no rectifying the case. He put his blade back down and walked through the doors. 
informing the entire courtroom that there is new evidence that could be provided, one from the testimonial of former Separatist collaborator Asajj Ventress. Anakin spoke from the heart, believing that Asajj would be the key to saving Ahsoka's life. He told them all that they could take a recess, when they returned they'd have the full story, and from there they could prosecute the right individual. Tarkin looked at Palpatine to make sure this was approved, and Palpatine didn't. He had no clue that Anakin was able to hear what he said, and truthfully speaking, Palpatine didn't think Anakin was coming back so soon. He wouldn't have said what he said about Ahsoka possibly being a collaborator if he knew that Anakin would walk back in. Palpatine was trying to play the fair game, but he needed Ahsoka gone so that Skywalker fell to the dark path. The recess would allow the prosecution and defense time to speak about their final strategies going into this. Anakin was again silent, simply thinking about all the things he could tell his quote-unquote good friend once this debacle was over and done with. When the time came, the court returned and Anakin went to bring the clones in. Captain Rex got to Anakin and told them that they brought the body of Barris. Skywalker asked why, and Kix, the medic, informed the general that there was residue of the nanotechnology on Barris. Anakin asked how that was possible, and Rex told him that it was likely because she was responsible for the bombing itself. He didn't really have any conclusive evidence, but Asajj didn't have anything on her. Anakin asked if it was a plant, and Rex informed him that it was literally impossible. They got there right as Barris was killed. There was no way for Asajj to plant any evidence against the Jedi. Anakin took a deep breath and told them that it was the best they could do. Asajj was waking up as it was. They marched in and the entire event was explained. Ahsoka was very shocked to see Asajj, but even more so to learn of the actual truth. The one that exposed Barriss Afi as the perpetrator and secured Ahsoka her freedom. Asajj was taken away, not for being a culprit, but for being a former separatist. Anakin actually did feel bad about the whole Ventress thing, but at least Ahsoka was safe. That was his main concern, and it was accomplished. After the trial, Anakin congratulated Ahsoka and thanked the boys in blue for helping them win the case. Ahsoka was also very overjoyed, but there remained a question of her loyalty to the Jedi Order. They betrayed her. She needed to figure out what she wanted to do. Is she remained a Jedi or not? While all this was happening, Anakin at one point or another vanished. He confronted his mentor Palpatine, and he did it without holding back. This wasn't because Anakin entirely blamed Palpatine, rather, this was a combination of Anakin's frustrations. Half of it was anger at the Jedi projected onto Palpatine, the rest of it was how unfair the trial had been, and how Palpatine, someone who knew and apparently cared for Anakin, couldn't see how this was a setup. Palpatine was shocked by the ignition of Anakin's lightsaber, as he told the elder politician that this was his fault. Palpatine stumbled backwards and asked what he meant, and Anakin explained, but the master manipulator of course corrected the conversation, delicately putting those words to rest and keeping his world guard away from making a move. Palpatine didn't believe there was any need for this situation to get out of control. He told Anakin that he couldn't pick favorites, but Anakin called the bluff. Palpatine wasn't not playing favorites, he was actively trying to push the jurors to vote for Ahsoka. That wasn't being neutral. He told them that Ahsoka was a separatist. The issue is, every time Palpatine defended himself and adequately used proper examples to make strong defenses for himself, Anakin got angrier. It was still a combination of rage at the Jedi and Palpatine, but the thing is, there'd be no de-escalating the situation. No matter what Palpatine did, Anakin was going to get angrier. It was due to so much building up and feeling like everything was a setup and then finally coming to a head and bursting. As their argument, or in Palpatine's mind discussion, started to ramp up, Skywalker acted out physically. This was because a realization crossed Anakin's mind, one in which he realized that Palpatine could take advantage of him too. That was unnerving just to think of. He committed blood Anakin just the way he did the jurors, and that didn't really add any calmness to Anakin's mind. He swung his lightsaber on a gut reaction, not considering what would happen if he actually killed Palpatine and at the last second, his blade was stopped in midair, like the force was gripping it. Before he could really understand what was happening, the royal guards jabbed their status forward and Skywalker fell to his knees with electricity covering his body. His Jedi weapon fell to the ground and he shrieked in agony. Palpatine stood emotionless, as if to show Anakin that no matter what, he would never supersede him. As Anakin was crying out in pain, Yoda came around the corner. This was for an unrelated reason. He was just here to talk to Palpatine about the Jedi and the Republic relationship, 
but he ignited his lightsaber and used the force to throw the royal guards backwards. They slammed into the wall and fell unconscious behind the Chancellor. Yoda pointed his weapon at Palpatine and told him to stand down. From Yoda's perspective, Anakin was a victim in this situation, and Yoda would always defend one of his own no matter what. He was actually acting on instinct for once. Palpatine snarled, telling Yoda to put that emerald weapon down. This was no fight he wanted any part in. He moved past Skywalker, who was still on his knees, reeling from the pain. Yoda told Palpatine that whatever he was doing would be exposed, and Sidious came out. He knew that having seen how cruel Palpatine could be, there was no saving the alternative identity. Sidious conjured up a means to make this work. He'd kill Yoda and Skywalker, and then blame it on the escape of somebody else. Not for nothing, there was no way Anakin would join his cause after this and Skywalker wasn't worth an eternal empire. He'd find another apprentice. That time would come later. Sidious told Yoda that his reign was over. As two crimson lightsabers ignited, he launched at the Grand Master, who in shock was unprepared, being thrown against the ground. As Sidious prepared to kill Yoda, Skywalker threw his lightsaber at Palpatine, which he blocked before having to parry Yoda. The only reason Sidious got such a jump on Yoda is because there were no hints of him being a Sith. Yoda was just protecting Anakin, not under any impression of Palpatine being evil, and now the odds were in the hands of both duelists. Sidious slammed his blade against Yoda's as Anakin got to his feet to aid the Grand Master. The duel was tense. It was in a tiny hallway, which meant the one with the most advantage was technically Skywalker. Both Sidious and Yoda used forms that required a lot more space to be effective. Luckily for Yoda, he was small enough to take advantage of the small space. Their blades passed at each other with extreme speeds. Skywalker was far out of his element. Sidious was incredible, fast as light, and while Anakin was taking advantage of the hallway, it wouldn't last forever. Yoda got around to Anakin's side in an effort to protect him. This forced Palpatine to fend off an aggressive assault from both Yoda and Anakin on the same side. To Skywalker, this wasn't the best feeling in the world, but knowing that the Grand Master had his back meant the galaxy to him. The two Jedi pushed Sidious backwards and out of the corridor. As they did, there was a corner and Yoda used it to bounce around Sidious, who kicked Anakin in the face which threw him back into a wall. Sidious turned back and focused on the Grand Master. There was a large walk that crossed over the main chamber of the courts. It was a common area, and as Palpatine pushed Yoda out onto the walk, the citizens, clones, and Jedi all looked up. They watched what appeared to be Palpatine fighting the Jedi as a Force user. Skywalker lunged forward before being kicked in the hip and almost thrown over the edge. Yoda used the force to stop him before blocking a strike. Sidious blasted lightning into Anakin's side and tried to throw him over the edge, but Yoda was quick to stop them before spinning forward. The attack knocked one of Palpatine's blades from his hands off the catwalk and he staggered back. Anakin looked over as Yoda and Palpatine engaged at an even more explosive rate. Sidious was furious. His attacks were getting closer and closer to stopping Yoda but one of the Jedi in the chambers jumped up. Sidious backflipped over himself and slashed his lightsaber across Plo Koon's wrist, before blasting him with electricity and sending him off the catwalk. Plo was in an unfavorable position, similar to how Coleman Trevor was killed on Geonosis by Jango Fat. Sidious continued his grueling fight with Yoda, as the clones tried to figure out what to do. Tarkin tried to give them orders to shoot the Jedi, but Obi-Wan delayed that order, stepping in so Yoda could do what he must. Anakin watched Plo tumble from the catwalk, but he was caught by Windu who used the force to lower him gently to the ground. Sidious slid under Yoda as he threw Yoda back and turned to face Skywalker who charged him. Former friends fought with each other. Anakin tried everything he could to defeat Palpatine, but it wasn't working. He then took his metallic wrist and threw it into Palpatine's abdomen and then swing his blade up, but he was disarmed. Anakin threw his hands up to block Palpatine's strike and as he did, Yoda thrusted his blade through Palpatine's back a strike that was immediately lethal. Anakin fell backwards and Yoda looked over to see that he was okay, before looking down to see that Plo was still alive as well. This whole situation was a mess. The Jedi were confused by everything that had just happened, but the public had already formed their opinions. Due to the courts being just that, courts, there were cameras everywhere, and the entire Republic and galaxy saw Palpatine attack a Jedi. From their point of view, it was Palpatine who was the aggressor, and Yoda who was the defender. It's ironic, being that Yoda was the attacker, kind of, but the public only saw this perspective. There were no cameras behind the judge's seat because criminals weren't brought up there, so all the evidence that people of the galaxy had were the few minutes of fighting between Yoda, 
Anakin, and Palpatine on the catwalk. Also, due to the fact that Anakin had won over the hearts of the Republic, people were a lot more sympathetic to him. He was the war hero, and if he was fighting the Chancellor, then perhaps there was something they didn't know about him. And the truth is, they didn't understand why Palpatine had a red lightsaber. No other Jedi had that color. It wasn't like Mace's purple blade, because there was a history of other Jedi using purple lightsabers, but Palpatine's was almost evil. The public was a little iffy initially. They loved their Chancellor, but this wasn't him. Of course, there were perspective pieces in the media, and pulls for the public to go with one opinion or the other, but they all saw the truth, or what they perceived was the truth. It became a race for those who supported the Jedi, and those who loathed them, to seize control of the Senate and get their way. The Order reacted hastily to make sure that they made sure their stance was as clear as possible. They, with the help of the archivist Jocasta Nu, created a video presentation to assist the public with understanding the fight. Many of the advocates against the Jedi used the fact that Dooku was a leader of the Separatists to push people away from the Order, but thanks to Palpatine revealing himself to be a Sith, the Jedi could kill two birds with one stone. The plan was executed as such. The Jedi explained who the Sith were and what they stood for. They then explained that Palpatine was a Sith, and he likely manipulated Dooku to join the Separatists so they could create a proxy war. The way of the Sith was to control, and with thousands of years of documented history with not just the Jedi but the Republic, their stance was hard to refute. There were those who stood against the Jedi, but at this point no one really could. They were honest and their intentions were true. They were public servants and they were trying to do the right thing. The only lie that was told was the fact that Palpatine attacked Anakin without provocation. It was just a way to explain how the fight actually started. From Yoda's point of view, this was the truth, so no harm, no foul. As for Ahsoka, with the trial being finished and this whole new endeavor beginning, decided to rejoin the Order as a knight. While she was upset with the Council and their belief that it was the will of the Force, she remained. This was solely because Barriss didn't leave behind her rousing speech. Had she openly ridiculed the Jedi and everything they stood for, Ahsoka would have had other thoughts on becoming a Jedi again. Also, the whole Palpatine being a Sith Lord in charge of the Republic helped her think that perhaps there were worse evils in the galaxy than the Jedi, who had a couple oopsies here and there. Due to the public rallying around the Jedi and the death of Palpatine, Dooku needed to react. He couldn't just let the Jedi continue to hold a grip over the Republic. He decided that he needed to put the war into full overdrive. However, that would be a little bit of an issue for him. Dooku's military was already in an inconvenient location. This was the last year of the war. He wasn't supposed to be winning. So Dooku strategized a blitz maneuver with Grievous and Admiral Trench. He was hopeful that one of the two of them would be able to make a deep push into Republic territory. If he could draw their main fleets away from Coruscant, he could blindside the capital and take it for himself, crowning himself victor of the Clone War. This was actually, in his own mind, a better result than what would have actually originally happened. With the Clone Wars becoming an elongated conflict, the Republic needed a new leader, one that wasn't tied to Palpatine. The public decided that the Senate was one that needed new leadership, and no one who supported Palpatine would have their support. All of his closest allies and advocates were either silenced or forced from office. The interim chancellor was considered close to a rebel, due to how far away they sat from Palpatine, but it was best for the Republic. This new interim would make an effort to negotiate a peace treaty, but it was exceptionally difficult. Without someone willing to stand as the middle ground for these peace discussions, it was nearly impossible. Satine would have done it in a heartbeat, but she had been gone for a little over a month by this point. The wound was still fresh, and the Republic was eager to try and make a move to end this war. But with no peace treaty accepted, nor a ceasefire approval from the Separatists, it was back to the front lines for the Jedi. The war had to continue until the victor was crowned. While Dooku's plans to smash the Republic with Trench, Grievous, and extra reinforcements sounded like a plan, it was nearly impossible. The Republic was dug in. They had three years of war to get their heads on straight and properly defend their territory. They had golden platforms, they had more fleets, militia forces, more clones, and even an assortment of hypervelocity cannons installed by the now court-martialed Captain Tarkin. Despite him being loyal to the Republic, the Senate wasn't trusting of anyone who was close to Palpatine. This meant people would lose positions, titles, be imprisoned, or more. There would be fair trials after the war, and that was promised, but until Dooku was killed, the public couldn't risk it. Mace Windu at this point went on a quest to find Dooku and bring him to justice. 
He was moving his main fleet and was blindsided by a massive fleet under Grievous' command. And because the good general wanted a straight fight, one in which he could kill one of the most ruthless Jedi Masters in the Order, he boarded Windu's flagship. This was a terrible idea on his behalf. Not only because the fleet battle was an even grudge match, but because it was Mace Windu. Inside the hangar bay, clones and droids fought with each other, and the Jedi Master stood with his troops, fighting with them. Then Grievous approached. He actually moved through the droid lines and then jumped at Mace. But the Jedi General didn't have time for this. It may have not been the Jedi way, but when it came to Grievous, did it really matter? Mace lifted his right hand while blocking blaster fire with his other and clenched his fist. So as Grievous was jumping towards him, Mace didn't budge and he used the force to snap Grievous' heart, killing him instantly. The droid general dropped at Mace's feet, and the Jedi led a counter assault, one that would crown the Jedi as victors of this hangar battle and eventually lead to their victory in space. While this was terrible for the Separatist movement, Admiral Trench was getting somewhere, but that didn't matter. Trench's forces were engaging in the mid-rim when they were countered by Master Plo's and Master Tin's fleets. Meanwhile, Dooku would accidentally have a run-in with Kenobi, Skywalker, and Tano. This was actually a spy mission, and the three of them fell into Dooku's lap by happenstance. They were getting their information on the Separatist statistics, because the influx of new battle droids in ships were noticeable. When they were moving out of the facility, they ran into Dooku in the hallway. One of those awkward encounters, and the Countess Reno attacked them. Ahsoka by this point was wielding blue lightsabers due to her change in status and in soul. Masters Kenobi and Skywalker led the attack, with Ahsoka running the aggressive acrobatic assault. Dooku was very talented, but with Anakin's powers doubling each encounter, Obi-Wan being Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka being a first-time opponent, he was stuck. Dooku's goal was always to get rid of the weakest link, but the dark side was aging his body, and he was fighting three very talented Jedi, so he was the weakest link. He did put up a good fight, one where he was throwing the Jedi into different sides of the rooms and forcing 1v1s or 1v2s, but nothing ever leading to him hitting the kill. These three were the perfect team for fighting someone of Dooku's strength. Defense, aggression, and even more aggression seemed to be the perfect counter. While Dooku and Grievous' deaths would be jarring for the Separatist government, Admiral Trench had as many lives as a Lothcat. He kept finding ways to stay alive which meant he was able to burst through one or two Republic fleets before having to retreat or call for reinforcements. His war games with the Republic would elongate the war for another year, but by the time of his final defeat, the CIS had already surrendered. He at the point of his loss would pretty much be operating on his own. With the Sith officially gone, the Jedi would celebrate their destruction with caution. They learned from this encounter that they could be destroyed if they lowered their guard, if they became complacent. The Clone War taught the Jedi a lot, but most importantly, it held a mirror up to them, one showing them what they really were, in comparison to what they thought they were. Their resolve would never be stronger, as they would return to being peacekeepers in the galaxy. Master Skywalker would eventually join Obi-Wan on the High Council, and there'd be no speak of children for Anakin and Padme. That could come later, as in, in a couple years when they actually planned for them. Ahsoka would eventually become an instructor of Ganudi, due to Katuni being taken on by another teacher. Anakin would watch in pride as the lineage of his master and his master before him was carried on through Ahsoka. With the extra guidance of the Jedi Order around her, she would eventually become a successful Jedi Master. The bond between the Jedi and the Republic wouldn't ever be the same, though this would never be a negative bond. It just meant that the Jedi Order no longer trusted the government of the galaxy to be their guide. The Order made reparations for their negligence in parts of the galaxy by taking care of those hurt by their complacency. The balance restored would be enjoyed for generations to come, and the Order's new direction would ensure that the Jedi maintained peace for everyone in the galaxy. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to our patrons, Benjamin Wells, Jenga Fett Clone, Nick5098, M, INTJ Recluse, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tib, CC2024, Galva Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William, 1767, Darth Revan, Grand Eddie Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, 
The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wii 670, Anakin Runner, CT 7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Nguyen, Saints of Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, 3D Gamer, Lord Kallik, Young Lee 66, Man Man Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Ford's Legacy Star Wars, Airbus, Rex the Wolf, Man Three First Names, Dark C46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing. Before supporting the channel, let's talk about this story. I wanted to play with perspectives a lot. This was a story where I wanted a lot of back and forth happening. Uh, the perspectives between Barris versus Asajj and Anakin in the trial room, as well as Anakin fighting Palpatine, then Yoda thinking Palpatine's attacking Anakin, and the public thinking Palpatine attacked Yoda. It's kind of this back and forth, and I wanted to play with the idea of, of perception, and I thought that was kind of fun to do. As for like the only reason the Royal Guards would attack Anakin, and the only reason Palpatine would use a force is in a dire state where he might get hurt. And that's the only reason why he used a force on Anakin there to stop him, and why the Royal Guards attacked him. But I really want the emphasis of Palpatine's demise being that Yoda just happens to walk in at the right time. But anyways, I hope you all enjoyed, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.